Okay, in this lecture I'm going to review a little bit what we've done last couple of days and show how it connects to our atomic structure unit and of course give you a little preview like I did today into bonding and then return to the uh, worksheet that we were filling out today. So uh, a couple of things I want to talk about as a little bit of review here is that an atomic structure, okay, and uh, here we go with atomic structure, we were talking about the development of the atom and specifically all the models through the um, Bohr model into the, uh, well first we had the, the, the uh, solid sphere models of Dalton, J.J. Thompson, into the Bohr model, into quantum mechanical model orbitals, and we went from circular orbits of electrons, planetary model from the nucleus, and then we moved to wave mechanics where these electrons didn't exist in orbitals but in orbits. We've also learned that they actually have shapes, three-dimensional shapes. Okay, P's have dumbbells and so forth, but they still exist as waves, okay, and still how far away you exist from an electron to a nucleus. All those things that we learned about the quantized model of electrons still holds true. From all of this, we got something called the electron configuration. Okay, and electron configuration basically allowed us to organize the electrons okay into a neat little system that was quantized meaning had discrete energy levels we had a nucleus it's positive and then we had uh, our um, basic structure 2-8-1 if we're talking about uh, sodium which some of us know is 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s1 okay the arrangement of the electrons into specific areas. And this led us to understand this organizational pattern, something about stability. Okay, now stability means that atoms want to have low energy. We began our discussion with stability where we excited electrons that were closer to the nucleus made them unstable by gaining energy and they jumped back and became stable and gave off light. That was the emission stuff that we talked about. But we're talking about in terms of chemical bonding. Okay, Atoms want to achieve low energy. So elements that we started talking about in September become compounds when they're bonded. And the reason, the driving force is they want to, to move from high energy to low energy. So the reason why chemicals bond is to achieve stability. Now there's more to the story in that, but that's essentially what we're dealing with. So the configurations that we learned here allowed us to understand this type of stability. Why? Well, we had the noble gases, group 17 element, that had the most stable configurations. For instance, helium is 1s2, or the same thing as having a 2. And then, of course, we had uh, a neon, which was 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, which was, again, 2-8. And we saw that these very, very, very importantly stable configurations is what all elements wanted to become. So when elements became compounds, they did so by doing what they had to do to achieve stable configurations. So we noticed that sodium likes to become sodium plus. And we learned that, hey, that happens in atomic structure by losing an electron. And so when sodium bonds, it does so because it becomes Na+. And we learned that Na+, is as stable, okay, as neon. We're not going to go into those specifics. Chlorine, when it bonds, loves to become chlorine negative. So it gains an electron to become stable, okay, to become as stable as argon. So these elements do these things, and we learned about chlorine gaining one more electron, sodium losing, and we learned all of this in atomic structure that, hey, configurations tell us something about what elements 
how they how they get stable. Okay, and then we moved on to let's go to the next screen. We moved on to all right the next uh, unit. We moved on to periodic table, and we continued the story. And it certainly wasn't over, because in this story, okay, in periodic table, we did take a step back and say, well, how was this table organized? We go back to atomic structure, defining the atom. Well, this all this started with uh, John Dalton in the early 1700s. You want to go back to the Greeks? You can. So all this stuff, Bohr was turned a century uh, 1900s early, so we've had about 200 years of development in between, and quantum mechanics is about 1920s into the 30s, okay, into our current model. So we went backwards in time around in this area for periodic table to continue the story, because at this po at point, we understood from our atomic structure lesson, our unit, that electron configurations explain stability. Everybody drives toward the noble gas con configuration, all right? How? Either by gaining or losing electrons. That's how they did that. Now, in truth, as we said today a little bit, they also do it by sharing electrons, okay? But essentially, they have to either fill their orbitals or, or their energy levels or lose electrons to have a filled orbit to be stable like noble gases. So we went back into the periodic table and we saw that the elements were organized based on uh, chemical and physical properties. So Dmitry Mendeley and a bunch of different people we talked about saw that the chemical properties of elements were repeating. Okay? You know, he had a deck of cards and he put that elements according to atomic numbers in a row, okay, and he noticed after he got to the seventh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh card, the next element that's heavier had the same chemical properties as the one above it, and as he went through his 50 or 60 so art elements, he started seeing there was a pattern. Notice there were some places where he didn't have elements, and he predicted them. Now, I'm not going to revisit all that, but it was based on the idea that there were some elements that had similar chemical properties. We now know that means they have the same valence electrons. And because you have the same amount of electrons you have to lose or gain to become stable through configurations, you would have the same chemical properties. Okay? And quantum mechanics that we learned from the last unit explained this organization to the T because we had the S block and the P block. And this explained everything another way. Okay, so um, getting back to all this, what did this mean? Well, why were the chemical properties repeating? Besides valence electrons, what allowed these electrons to become stable? And it was part of our discussion through the, um, the block that it came to light that stability is important, but it's not the entire story. To the, these elements want to become stable. They do so by losing or gaining electrons. But the ability, ability to become stable is explained through the periodic trends. I can't say it enough. The periodic trends that we learned through electronegativity, through ionization energy, which you should have all realized are just products of the atomic radius changing, okay, is what in fact made those chemical properties in the same columns or rows, however you want to look at it, possible. Yes, elements want to become stable. They want to gain or lose electrons to achieve noble gas configurations. So they want to be like noble gases. And they do that by their electron flow. Electron flow. Okay? But whether or not they can do it, that's important, is decided by these trends. Okay? Now, what, so these trends give the ability to do this. So when we look at atomic radius, as we did already this week, the big atoms, 
on this side are our metals. The small atoms are the nonmetals, okay? And they have particular properties that result directly by size alone. We learn that we have a divider between these two, okay? And those are the noble, those are the metalloids or semimetals. But you should know why these trends go, and it's very, very simple. You get bigger, your electrons feel the nucleus less, therefore the attraction is lower, and the amount of energy it takes to remove them is lowered if you feel the nucleus less. As you go across, as you add protons, in the same energy level with no screening, radius gets smaller because you attract them more. The, the nucleus is strong with more protons, and of course it takes more energy to pull them away. Okay, But these values, as you've already learned from your lab, are given to you in table S if you have to look them up. All right, so back to where we were. All right, we have this uh, metals and nonmetals. And we filled this out, and we talked about the group one, this family of elements that are related by chemical properties. Now that we know that's the same valence electrons, they're able to become stable but by losing one electron. These are the alkali metals. They're the most reactive metals. The second most reactive, of course, are the alkaline earth metals. The nonmetals, which are above the staircase, that divider we talked about, are the halogens. The elements that have the stable configurations that we've been talking about since September are the noble gases. All right? And of course, when you look at this periodic table, it explains the ability to do certain types of bonding, as we talked about. These lose electrons and these gain. So let's define, define, I mean, the properties. And do this somewhere on your table. Okay, if you want to put a separate sheet, you can if you feel like you're getting too sloppy. But we have to define the major properties. What makes metal a metal is not entirely what you think. First of all, to be a metal, you have a large radius. Large atomic radius. That's the bottom line. A nonmetal, you have a small atomic radius. everything else follows suit. Because of a large atomic radius for a metal, of course you have low attraction, a low electronegativity. I'll leave that as elect. Okay? Of course, nonmetals being smaller have a high attraction. The reason why they are small is, is they pull in those electrons. So higher electronegativity. That should be number two there. Okay, number three for metals. They, of course, have a low ionization energy. Now, I know it says first ionization energy. That's the amount of energy it takes to pull one electron away. There's something called second ionization energy. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Now, of course, nonmetals being small, all right, they have a high attraction, small radius. It takes a lot of energy to pull one away. All right. Now, moving on. What other things happen to metals? Well, as I ex explained in some of the classes, because they hold on to electrons loosely, their electrons are able to move. If electrons are able to move, they can conduct electricity. And heat. Think with me for a second. I know I gave you this example. If I've got electrons, that are e easy to move in a metal, and I put something negative here, all these electrons will repel. And these electrons that repel, repel these electrons, and you're going to push electrons off to this side. And this side will get negative. And charge has been conducted if these electrons can move within the atoms. We can predict that this, this is we pretend it's like copper. All right? So if you have a nonmetal, okay, it's a terrible conductor. They don't conduct heat and electricity very well. And the reasoning is, very simply, is because they are insulators. They're terrible conductors, insulators, okay? They're terrible conductors. Now, why? Because their electrons are held tighter. So when you have a charged object, let's say on a rubber piece of rubber, 
these electrons are held so tight, they're not, they can't move enough to move these electrons. Remember, metals, like the one I'm drawing above, they were able to move, so they were able to repel the other electrons forward, and therefore charge was conducted. Non-metals don't move, so these electrons don't feel any extra charge, and therefore they don't move other electrons, and therefore this side of the rubber, rubber doesn't feel any charge. And heat, heat is motion. If motion hits these electrons, they don't move very much because they're being held tighter. Therefore, it's not conducted motion through. So non-metals are the reason why we, they're insulators. They're the rubber around the wire. The wire, of course, is the conductor. Think of your coolers, think of your thermos bottles, think of insulation in your home, all made of non-metals to keep the heat in or keep the heat out in the summertime, all right?